Hi and welcome to Destination Michigan. We're here to explore the beauty, creativity, and destinations in our Great Lakes state. Tonight, we'll meet some outstanding Michiganders and we'll travel across the mitten to visit the communities that make Michigan unique. First up on tonight's journey, we'll go to Glen Arbor, where Destination Michigan's Stephanie Mills explores the elegant and rustic charm of the Cottage Bookshop. Then our next stop is in East Lansing, where we'll meet the charitable members of the Great American Fierce Spirit Organization. Plus, they built a governor's mansion in Marshall, but the Capitol never made it there. We'll tell you what went wrong and show you the unique and historical side of the community. Then we'll head to Detroit for some street food at the Mac Shack Food Truck. And wrapping up tonight's episode, Bob Garner takes us on a tour of Kogel's Meats in Flint. I'm Courtney Jerome, and you're tuned in to Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. If you're looking to get lost in a new book, the Cottage Bookshop in Glen Arbor can help you find exactly what you're looking for. Stephanie Mills takes us inside the cabin that started off much differently than what it is today. Today we're checking out the Cottage Bookshop in Glen Arbor, a place that may draw you in just with its rustic looks, but whose past reads like the pages of a history novel. They were selling it. Uh, it was in the family a long time. The, the couple had been married in front of the fireplace. It meant a great deal to them. They wanted to build a, a year-round home in the place of it. So I think that somebody would have wanted it and moved it, but I like to think that I, I saved it. <laughs> Memories were written inside this charming log cabin long before people began making it a destination for buying books. This building was built in 1920, and it, it, it's very original, and I wanted to maintain it that way. We originally was a summer cottage, the first log summer cottage on the big, big Glen. And so it has a really long history, and which makes it even better. From summer cottage to bookstore, when Barbara Sipker purchased it in 2000, she turned a dream into a reality, but it was no easy feat. At the time, she and her daughter were running the cottage bookshop inside a historical building in town. When Barbara bought the cottage, she moved the entire building from the lake to the slot. She lost the fireplace in the move, but everything else stayed intact. It's just such a strong character, and, it, and it is, it's perfect for an independent bookstore, and it's perfect for the, our name, the Cottage Bookshop, but it's, it just was, you know, I saw it and it was like, this is it. With its elegant rustic looks, not just on the outside, the cabin beautifully captures the essence of Northern Michigan. And with all the artwork, posters, and postcards, there's no shortage of love for its surroundings here. I've worked very hard on making an image of this place that people will connect and love the experience of being here. It's no secret that Northern Michigan is one of the best places to visit, so it only makes sense that the best sellers here are all about keeping it local. People are not coming here for the New York Times bestsellers. Our best sellers uh, have in the past been our local books because we carry many of those, many signed by you know, local, the local history and the local authors. Children's is a very large section and our fiction continues to, to grow. The latest chapter in the story of this iconic landmark has a new author. Barbara is in the process of selling the shop to Sue Boucher. Sue previously owned her own bookstore near Chicago. And while she's looking forward to new challenges, she thinks the transition will be pretty seamless. One of the things is that Barbara and I have a very similar sentiment in a lot of ways. When I got here and I saw the 
cards that she chose, I thought, well, I have these cards. And when I saw this section of design books, I, I, we had a wonderful section of design books, and I love design books. So we have very similar sentiments in choosing books, and I think that I can slide right in. Sue started shopping at the Cottage Bookshop years ago when she began spending her summers in northern Michigan. And for her, like so many others, the experience goes beyond buying a book. I have to say, the first couple days I thought, oh boy, what are you doing? <laughs> as soon as I rode my bike across that narrows, I thought, this is awesome, I love this. And rode my bike to work and just got to do what I really like about book selling, which is selling books. It was like Christmas and it was fun. So uh, it kind of captured my heart again. It's not identified with me, it's identified with the kind of the whole building and, and ambience and, it's, and that's what's important. The Cottage Bookshop has several book clubs, programs, and events to enjoy. To learn more, head to their website, cottagebooks.com. Now we travel from northern to mid-Michigan to meet an East Lansing organization that aims to get people active in their community. A teacher, a 911 responder, a father of a soldier. What do they all have in common? Beards. Yes, I said beards, and they're beards for a cause. Let me explain. These three are amongst many others who are all members of the Great American Fierce Beard Organization, one of the many beard-loving organizations in Michigan. The mission of Lansing's GAFBO for short, a cause to donate to others and to better their community. GAFBO has grown into a very re well-recognized club in Lansing. People come up to us and say, hey, you're in GAFBO, and, or have you heard of GAFBO? And, they just know that we're going to be around. We're going to be doing things in our community. We're going to be participating at Dickens Village in Old Town, doing arts and crafts with kids. We're going to be throwing fundraisers. We pick up trash on the side of the highway. And so I mean, they just, they know who we are. They want to support us and help us out. And we want to support them and help out wherever we can. The obvious element of fun that this Facial Hair Social Club has is truly how it began a group of men who had an unofficial, friendly competition on who could grow the fiercest beard. Back then, they tallied votes around town for bragging rights. But now, the story of how the official organization came to be is a serious one, when one of their members was diagnosed with cancer. Kevin, who had, was the impetus for GAFBO, was diagnosed with testicular cancer, and we sort of changed the focus. We said, all right, well, we'll grow our beards, and every day, week, or month, we grow our beards. We'll have people donate to the American Cancer Society. And GAFBO sort of grew from that. We decided to change the focus. It was more fulfilling, and our moms couldn't hate us for growing beards anymore. <laughs> These days, GAFBO has a couple dozen members who meet on a regular basis to plan their next fundraising efforts, like the meeting we're visiting tonight. We say, okay, what's a local charity that you are passionate about or involved in currently? And everyone sort of gives their plea. Like they, they say, oh, I want to do it for the Science Center. I want to do it for the zoo. I want to do it for, you know, Ellie's Place. I want to do it for Ronald McDonald House, whatever it is. And everyone kind of gives their case and we vote. And it's a simple majority rules for who gets the money. and. Everyone seems okay with it, because we know the next time through, we're going to do a different charity, and we're going to help people out any way we can. And the list of charities GAFBO has helped goes on and on, from food drives to Toys for Tots to a Lansing organization that repairs used bicycles and donates them back to underprivileged kids. One of the many fun ways the Great American Fierce Beard Organization raises money for charities like these is through formal facial hair competitions. So in 2012, GAFBO hosted the Great Lakes Regional Beard Mustache Competition. It is an event that has several hundred people, mostly from the Great Lakes states. They come in, they have various categories that they can compete in, beard, mustache, partial beard, and you know, styled or not styled, and ladies categories for ladies most creative, most realistic. We've had kid categories in the past where kids have made fake beards. And it's just a, it's a reason for people to come together, throw a party with facial hair, raise money for charity. And so that's more of the local level ones. And then there are national competitions uh, hosted by various organizations where people come from all over the country or even from other countries to compete 
and it's a little more prestigious. And then every two years, there's the World Beard Mustache Championship, which is the granddaddy of them all. It's where the best of the best show up. It's gonna be in Austria in 2015. And then it's gonna be in Austin, Texas in 2017. But what's the best of the best? And how do they get their beards to look like that? Style is very important, very important. Uh, your first competition or two, you're kind of new to it. You really don't know what's going on. Um, and then all of a sudden you realize that it's the whole appearance that kind of helps win a category. For the freestyle category, you can use styling aids such as mousse, hairspray, hair dryers, as long as there's no pins or clips or anything. It can be pretty intricate. You can spend up to an hour and a half, two hours styling your beard. Basically spend a lot of time in hotel bathrooms in your room with a hair dryer and a can of hairspray. And at the end of the day, all the hairspray is worth it. It's fun. It's ridiculous, and but we love it. And I mean, anything that brings people together, has a good time. So. Facial hair is awesome. Beards are awesome. Mustaches are awesome. Gaffo. We're trying to make everything else awesome. If you're interested in joining the Gaffo organization and don't have a beard, that's okay. They welcome everyone. To contact them about how to get involved, their website is gaffbo.com. Now, if you want to get a sense of what one of the Mitten's first communities look like, look no further than Marshall, Michigan. Just off I-94, east of Battle Creek, it's one of those unique places that would look drastically different today had it not been for one major turning point. Here's Stephanie Mills with the history. We're really proud of Marshall, and think of it as a place where we say history comes alive, our history has a future, and we're a, a modern community that's proud of its past. Marshall's past began in the 1830s thanks to founder Sidney Ketchum and his brother George. The settlers from New York State named the community after Chief Justice of the United States John Marshall, and they had big plans for the town's future. As the state was developing, uh, there was an understanding that the state capital needed to be somewhere outside of Detroit if the state was going to grow. A lot of the political leaders in the state thought that Marshall should be the state capital. The fate of the state's capital seemed all but assured for the people of Marshall. They had the state capital grounds planned and they even built this home which would serve as the governor's mansion. But fate handed them a historical blow. As the uh, political things were happening, uh, Ann Arbor got the university, the first state prison went to Jackson and stuff, and people in Marshall were expecting it to become the state capital. But when there was a crucial vote in the legislature in 1847, Marshall failed by one vote. One vote may have sealed the deal, but history would not pass the community by. Through a major preservation effort, there are over 850 structures designated as historical landmarks throughout the town today. One of them includes this building, the incredibly intriguing Honolulu House built in 1860 by former Michigan Supreme Court Justice Abner Pratt, who lived in the Hawaiian Islands for a short time. It combines his love for tropical, Italian, and Gothic architecture. He fell in love with the islands and decided when he did come back to Marshall in 1860 from the islands, he would build his own little tropical paradise right here in the middle of Marshall. So it's not a duplication of a home that he lived in but built just the way the judge wanted it. The intrigue begins when you walk in the front door and notice the spiraling staircase and boldly hand-painted walls and ceilings. This staircase goes to nowhere except the attic, observation tower, and roof. We believe the judge put this staircase here mainly to impress you. You're going to notice in the entranceway the beautiful artwork. The artwork above this ceiling and by the staircase is all original. The rest of the artwork that you're going to see on the walls of the entranceway, these were painted between 1883 and 84. The third owner of the house decided he couldn't live with all those tropical murals. Every room is painted differently in a high Victorian style with a lot of gold leaf trim, silver, bronze, and copper paints, over 240 colors on this floor of the home. A neat little trick is to use a mirror to scan all the fine details on each room's ceiling. Nothing is the same. The 
The third owner, Martin Wagner, also had an unusual remodeling plan involving the fireplaces. He took out 10 of the original marble fireplaces and replaced them with false marble for a more dramatic look. The main floor is comprised of several rooms, including the family parlor, the judge's study, and formal dining room, each unique in its own way. The formal side of the home consisted of the formal parlor. You'll notice in the center of the room is the chandelier. This chandelier originally was a combination light. Globes pointing up were gas lights, globes pointing down electric lights. It's one of a kind. While the top half of the home was used for entertaining guests, the bottom is where the family lived. Less grand, but quaint and comfortable. Down here you'll find a dining room, kitchen, and what was once staff quarters. But today is a room where you could spot things like this fold-down tub and other items all made in Marshall. We use this room as a teaching area for children. The children don't always understand what it would be like to be without electricity or running water or electric stoves. And so this is where we love to bring the children and teach them. The George Bullard family was the last to live here until 1950. Harold Brooks then acquired the Honolulu House before selling it to the Marshall Historical Society 11 years later. While there are always new projects and things to fix around it, preserving its past is simply a way of life around here. Historic preservation is an important part of the community's ethic, but we're also a, a, a viable, uh, strong town with a, with a great downtown business district, a good place to live and work. The Honolulu House is one of 11 museums belonging to the Marshall Historical Society. Learn how you can take a tour of your own at marshallhistoricalsociety.org. Our next destination is in Detroit, where a husband and wife team bring gourmet macaroni and cheese to the streets via their food truck, the Mac Shack. You know, my husband and I have a passion for, for traveling and street food, so we were already involved in one food truck, um, and you know, we, we were always looking on Craigslist, always looking for kind of that next uh, venture and opportunity, and we found a cool little uh, trailer that was for sale, and just scooped it up and, and decided to turn the mac and cheese into a concept. Um, my husband makes a killer mac and cheese, so that's kind of how it started. You know, we thought, what could we do with this product, and, and how can we bring it to the, to the market and, and to the streets? So we decided to call it the Mac Shack, because normally you will, like, put vinyl on the side of a trailer, you know, make it look pretty. But this it was a little bit rough on the exterior, so we were, it just kind of all came together, like, let's make it a shack. Let's put cedar shake side siding on it and just call it a shack. So that's how the Mac Shack was born. Lindsay and Dan Garrick brought the Mac Shack to life in 2011, serving cheesy creations to lunch seekers in downtown Detroit. Whether they're parked at Campus Martius, Cadillac Square, Wayne State, Eastern Market, or Metro Detroit for the day, their menu can make your mouth water on even the hottest of days. We figured, you know, everybody loves tacos, everybody loves mac and cheese, so we'll probably have a home run if we open a mac and cheese truck. So it cornered the, uh, the foodie market there, I guess. He is a great, a great chef. He's not, you know, classically trained and, and didn't go to school for it, but you know, self-taught. And um, so, from the food end of things, he handles everything from, you know, the concept to the recipes and, and things like that. And Dan knows his recipes. With experience in film set catering, owning a pizzeria, and traveling the world to find unique tastes, he's able to bring flavor to a dish beyond just cheese and pasta. We make a five cheese blend of mac and cheese and put just some unique flavors with the mac and cheese. I think the, the one where people kind of look sideways at it until they have it is called the Koh San Road, um, which I got that from traveling in Thailand. The first place the backpackers dumped off when you reach Bangkok is Koh San Road, and there's this huge melting pot from every type of weirdo in the whole world comes to one place. So I finally felt at home. So I was, you know, eating, eating street food all over, and one of those things is obviously uh, a pad thai. So we put bean sprouts and um, sriracha and um, squeeze of lime and uh, cilantro and peanuts on mac and cheese. And it somehow worked. So then we sell a lot of it. So I think that would be like the maybe signature one for Mac Shack. Plus, the Shack serves up more than just mac and cheese. You'll want to check out their untraditional twist on the french fry too. 
So, how do the Garricks feel about combining their passion for travel and street food and turning it into a business? Yeah, it's great. I, I, every day I wake up and I, you know, things get challenging sometimes, you know, as it, as it does when you own your own business, but there's a, a lot of pressure on you. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to step back and say, this is, this is pretty awesome that we're able, you know, that we're able to, to do this. It's really cool. The Mac Shack's latest ventures are catering and renting the truck for events. Find out where they're parked on a daily basis at MacShackMichigan.com. Well, what pairs well with mac and cheese? Hot dogs. Destination Michigan's Bob Garner takes us on a tour of Kogel's fine meat products, home to the famous Vienna. My destination this week on Destination Michigan is truly a delight. Mm. It's the Kogel Meat Packaging Plant located near Bishop Airport in the Flint area. Kogel's hot dogs and ring bologna have been longtime staples at the Garner household. Generations back, Albert Kogel brought these recipes and his knowledge to the Flint, Michigan area, and the company traces its roots back to 1960. This same family has expanded the business and kept up the quality for 98 years. One of my favorite things in life is a chili dog made with a Kogel's Vienna. John Kogel knows they don't compete on price with other hot dogs, but he says the recipes won't change. Well, our, our tagline, made by my grandfather, up to a quality, not down to a price, and we have stuck with that. We want to put the same ingredients in, use the same processes that were developed years ago by my grandfather, because we believe it makes a difference in the end product. Tell me about your grandfather. He got started here in 1916. Yes. In Flint, Michigan. He came from Germany originally. He did. Yeah, he learned the business in Germany through the apprenticeship program, a six-year program, became a Wurstmacher, a master of Wurst, making, yeah. Sausage, yeah, making sausages. Actually settled up in the Milwaukee area, became a superintendent of a plant up there, but always wanted to do his own thing. So he asked some salesmen, you know, where should I go? And the salesman said, if you want to go someplace, go to Flint, Michigan, the auto industry is going to boom there. Indeed, that's what he did. Started out as a butcher, full line butcher, uh, sold retail cuts of meat as well as processed meats. Got more specialized, 1930, built his first plant. And then as refrigeration and packaging came to be, we were able to expand our market share, move out. And here, here we are in a plant that my, grand, my dad built, actually. John, the process by which you make, what, 35 different types of uh, meats? 35 different recipes, translating about 62 different products up front, but an eight count Vienna, a 24 count Vienna and a 10 pound box of Vienna, so that one recipe becomes three different types in the, in the retail marketplace. What's the future look like for Kogel? We are going to keep the quality. We believe that over time quality is going to come back as hopefully Michigan starts to come back, that we're going to be part of that and, and that people are going to look around the not only Michigan but the country, are going to want quality products and we're going to be there for them when, they, when they're ready. Plan on staying in Michigan? Yeah, absolutely. We, yep, born and raised. I'll, I'll die here in Michigan, and the company will too. And this is, this is our core market. We've been around for many years. Kogel's no longer offers public tours of their production facility, but you can visit them online at kogelsmeats.com. Now we'll conclude our episode with some Destination Michigan trivia for you. How many gallons of ice cream can Ludington's House of Flavors make a week? Stay tuned for the answer. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University-owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Our Destination Michigan trivia question for the night. How many gallons of ice cream does House of Flavors in Ludington make in a week? The answer is 400,000. That's 5,400 gallons of finished product per hour. The dairy has been located just west of downtown Ludington for over 70 years now. And today they have two Northern Michigan House of Flavors restaurant locations in Manistee and Ludington. Thanks for joining us tonight on Destination Michigan. We hope you'll tune in again and learn more about the state we all love to call home.